Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here online. We're going to start worshiping together, singing a song called No Longer Slave. So uh, from the comfort of your home, from your phone screen, from your computer screen, we welcome you here this Sunday morning. So please feel free to join us in singing together. A slave to fear. I am a child of God. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You are right. Cause you are right with me with the melody. Surround me with a song of deliverance, of deliverance from my enemies to all my fears. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Chosen me, love. Love has called my name. I've been born again to your family. Life flows through my veins. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. A child of God, I am a child. Darkness in 
Your mercy, I saved my soul. Now your freedom, now your freedom is all that I know. The only name. Come on, Jesus, when I met you, yeah, you called my name. To your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness. To your glorious day, see, I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. Chains weighed got the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I wasn't all fun. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, together virtually as your church gathering together despite the things that our world is going through right now God I thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together as your church across the interwebs to worship you together this morning thank you for each person who's tuning in this morning I pray that you will give them health give them calmness give them all that you have for them God that with, despite what's going on in our world we can praise you together this morning as your church God as we continue to worship together, I pray that you will open our hearts and our minds to being open to having you move within us this morning, God. We thank you for all that you do for us each and every day, and I pray that you will continue to bless us uh, every day that we go uh, together as your church, working in the world to be witnesses to your love to us, God. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture comes from Mark chapter 16, verse 7. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. This is the word of God for people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, are we ready? <laughs> well, good morning from Zachary United Methodist Church, where we are learning how to do church in a different way. I don't think I've ever preached my sermon on Sunday morning from my office, but uh, we are giving thanks for the blessing of technology. As we're all learning, the church is not tied to the limitations of space or a place on Sunday morning. We can still worship and we can still be the church, even though we are separated by this coronavirus. And that's really what I want to invite you to do today. I want to invite you to join me in worship and in hearing the Word of God together. <clears throat> now, our church has been in the midst of a series of sermons uh, that we began back during the season of Lent. It's the sermon series on God's grace. Because during the season of Lent, it is a time for us to really reflect and examine our lives in light of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we know that grace, 
God's amazing grace was at the heart of that. And today we have as our text one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. And the reason that it's one of my favorite verses is because of the story behind it and because of what it teaches us about God's restoring grace. I think we're all familiar with the events that took place leading up to that first Easter. You have Jesus and disciples going to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But we know that much more than just that happened there. Uh, we remember how Jesus was celebrated, how he was welcomed as he entered into the uh, city on that Palm Sunday. But just a few days later, he was betrayed. He was arrested and then he was crucified. And then he rose on the third day. But you remember how after Jesus was arrested, how all of his disciples fled in fear. I mean, all of them deserted him except for one, the disciple John. As Jesus hung there on that cross, suffering and dying, none of his disciples were there except for John. There was the mother of Jesus, Mary, and there were two other women named Mary as well, but all the others had fled. Yet, two of his disciples did something even worse. And we all know the story of Judas, how he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and then he went out and killed himself in remorse afterwards. But then there was Peter. Peter denied Jesus, not just once, but three times. And as he watched Jesus being arrested and ridiculed and beaten, you know, Peter was in fear for his own life. I mean, he was afraid that what they were doing to Jesus, that they would also do to him. So when they accused him of being one of them, he cried out with a loud voice, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know the man. And he did this. After hearing Jesus speak those words, whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. In spite of hearing those words, Still, he denies knowing Jesus at the time when Jesus needed him the most. Now, I sometimes get asked by people, what is the worst sin that you can commit in life? And of course, all sin is, is ugly, all sin is destructive. But to deny Jesus, to reject him, to go as far as Peter did, as to call down a curse upon himself and to shout out in front of everybody, I don't know the man, you know, that sin has to be among the worst. And that's the sin that Peter committed. In Luke's Gospel, we read how after Peter denied Jesus and Jesus looked at him, that Peter went outside and he wept bitterly. Perhaps you remember the song by Don Francisco, He's Alive. It tells the resurrection story from the perspective of Peter. And there's a powerful line in that song that says, when at last it came to choices, I denied I knew his name. Even if he was alive, it wouldn't be the same. Have you ever felt that way? As if it's never going to be the same again? Have you ever made a mistake in your life where you felt as though you could never re recover from that? As if you'd have to carry the shame and the guilt of that for the rest of your life? And there was no way that God would ever be able to forgive you or redeem you or ever use you again. That it would never be the same. I think most of us have experienced that or felt that way at one point or another in our lives. And that's one of the beauty of this story, because this story is really our story. Surely, this is how Peter felt. That it's never going to be the same. Uh, and this, it, this is why this, this verse is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Because you have these women who go to the tomb on the next day, and they're, they're going to try to prepare Jesus' dead body for burial. And when they get there, they see the stone is rolled away. And they, the grave is empty. Jesus is not there. Instead, what they find is an angel uh, sitting in that place. And the angel said, he's not here. He's risen. And then the angel said, but go tell the disciples and Peter. And that's the phrase that I want you to hear. And Peter. You know, all the other disciples but one had fled. They had all deserted him silently. But Peter, 
Peter's denial was loud. It was public for everybody to hear. And I can imagine at that part of his life, he probably felt as though uh, the group that he was a part of, those disciples, he was no longer part of that group. And, and the group of the disciples probably felt that Peter was no longer part of them. I mean, how could he be? He had all but turned in his resignation. And yet in this story, we see how God is the God of restoration. Because if you know anything about Peter's story, you know that he was forgiven, that he was restored. He became the leader of the early Christian church. I mean, it wasn't long after this that Peter was back in the pulpit, so to speak. He was preaching on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people were saved. Peter healed people with his prayers. God spoke to him through visions and through dreams. He was imprisoned at one point and was miraculously set free. When Peter walked down the street, uh, people sought to be in his shadow, convinced that if his shadow passed over them, they would be miraculously healed in some way. It was said that when Peter died, he requested to be crucified upside down, saying that he was not worthy to be crucified in the same way that his Lord was. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read Peter's story, it's as if the Peter of Acts and the Peter of the Gospels are really two different people. I mean, you would expect that the Peter of the Gospels would be overwhelmed with a sense of guilt, with a sense of shame because of the things he had done. I mean, how do you get over something like that? How, how do you show your face among the other disciples after doing something like this? And yet when you read First and Second Peter, you find that he doesn't mention anything about denying Jesus, not even once. The Peter of Acts and the Peter of the Epistles it doesn't seem to be a man that's overwhelmed with a sense of guilt and shame. Instead, what we find is someone who is speaking with great authority and great confidence. He tells his readers to practice self-control, which is saying a lot coming from Peter. He, he talks to his readers about being holy and about avoiding hypocrisy and about honoring God and living for God every day of your life. How could Peter be so uh, bold in his preaching and his teaching after he had failed Jesus so publicly. Well, the reason is that Peter had experienced the restoring grace of God in his life. He had experienced what it truly means to have your sins to wipe clean and to be given a second chance. Now, the critics of Peter could have easily said that this man does not belong in the church, or especially belong as a leader of the church. I mean, just look at his history. I mean, he's impulsive. He has a knack for saying the wrong things at the wrong time. I mean, Jesus even called him Satan at once. He made a fool of himself out on the Sea of Galilee trying to walk on water. And he aggressively attacked a soldier in the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, this man has been trouble from day one. In no way should he be a leader of the Christian church. You know what? All that would have been true, except for one fact that negates it all, and that is the restoring power of God's grace. And, and, and this is why I love this story so much, because it shows us that no matter how far we have fallen in life and how many times that we have fallen, you are never too far down to be picked up, cleaned up, and given a fresh start, a new beginning with God. For as we see in the story of Peter, our God is the God of the second chance. But he's more than that. He's also the God of the forgotten past. Because God says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. In chapter 10, verse 17, he says, Your sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. In Isaiah we read, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. The prophet Micah declares, He will again have compassion upon us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. So the good news today is that if you have fallen short and failed the glory of God in any way possible, then what you need to know is that you can experience the same kind of restoration that Peter experienced in his life. 
you can experience the same kind of redemption, the same kind of power, the same kind of forgetfulness that Peter experienced. How he was propelled from being a pathetic follower into a fearless leader. That could happen in your life too. The question, of course, is how? How does that happen? How do we get there? How can we experience the restoring power of God's grace? Well, I think this story of Peter gives us some insights into how we can re reconnect with God when we feel that we failed with God, or how we can experience God's restoring power through His grace. And the first thing is that we have to try to keep the door open to God's grace. Now, I know many people, when they uh, make mistakes in life, and they feel that they fail, they, they really just close the door to any possibility of experiencing God's grace or reconciliation. I mean, they actually end up making God's decision for him. And they, they believe and they decide that God's through with me and there's no turning back. There's nothing I can do to redeem this. That's what Judas did, you remember. After betraying Jesus, when he realized that Jesus was going to be crucified, he, he sought to give the money back to those who had bribed him, saying, I have betrayed an innocent man. Of course, the temple uh, personnel, they just laughed at him and said, you know, go your way. And you know what the really sad part of Judas' story is? Is he didn't wait. He didn't wait to see what might could have happened. He, he, he didn't consider the possibility that he could be forgiven and restored. Instead, he went out and killed himself. Now, I honestly believe that had he not done that, then the angel who was in the tomb that day would have said to those women, go and tell the disciples and Peter and Judas that I am alive. But Judas closed the door on that possibility of God's grace. And I know of many people today who've done the same thing. They close the door on the possibility of ever experiencing God's grace. And so they never experience being restored. I, I met a man not long ago who used to be a friend of mine. And I say that he used to be a friend of mine because I hadn't seen him in several years. He was a pastor within our conference here, and his marriage ended in divorce because he was caught in an affair. And as a result of that, he lost his credentials and had to step down from his position as a pastor. And as we were catching up, I asked him, well, where are you going to church now? He just laughed and said, well, oh, you can probably figure that out. I'm not going anywhere. I mean, that part of my life is over. And I said, oh, man, that's hard to believe. You mean you've, you've given up on God because of that? He said, oh, I haven't given up on God. I just felt like God's given up on me. And I said, you know, I don't know what your future holds for you, but I do know this. God has not given up on you. Now, I wasn't trying to minimize the gravity of his sin or anybody else. But here's what I know. If God can use a man like Peter, a man who, after being with Jesus for three years, a man who actually stood in the marketplace and shouted at the top of his lungs, I don't know this man. If God can use a man like that after his sins, then surely God can use you and me in spite of our sins. But in order to experience this restoring power of God's grace in our life, we have to strive to keep the door open. Because your sin will never have the power. It'll never have more power than God's grace. The Apostle Paul, who was another character in the Bible who experienced God's restoring grace, he said there is nothing in all of creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. Not things in life, not even death. So no matter where you are in life, no matter what has happened in your life, you can be restored by God's grace. So keep yourself open to that possibility. Here's the second thing I think we learned from this story about Peter, and that is that we need to try to keep the light on. Now, what do I mean by that? If you want to experience the restoring power of God's grace in your life, then you have to strive to allow ways for God's light to shine into your life. Because when you read in the Bible about life and about death, 
about good and evil, about hope and despair, about sin and restoration. The Bible always talks about those things in terms of, of light and darkness. And when you're dealing with sin and guilt in your life, truly, it always feels like things are very dark. But as God's Word remind us, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned, and the darkness cannot overcome it. So we don't have to live in the darkness. We can live in the light of God's restoring grace. And here are some specific ways that we can do that. First of all, we need to spend time in God's Word. Because as David said, God's Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And when you read the Bible, you're going to encounter people like Peter. You're going to encounter people like David and like Jonah and Abraham and Moses and Paul. People who foolishly turned their back on God and they committed sins that no person of God should ever commit. But all of them miraculously were restored by the grace of God. So when you're feeling far away from God because of things you've done, reading God's Word can help you to find hope through their stories. Reading God's Word enables you to reconnect with God and find your way home. Another way we can keep a light on our life is to try to find more time for prayer. <laughs> Spend more time in prayer. Now, I know that when we're dealing with sin and guilt in our life, it's really hard to turn to God because we think that God doesn't want to hear from us. He doesn't want to have anything to do with us. But you know, those are the moments when we need to pray the most. There's no saying, pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. And if you're like me, the times when I find it hardest to pray are those times when I feel like I am God's biggest appointment, disappointment. I, what I've learned though is in those moments, that's when I need to pray the most. Remembering that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love for us. The whole point of the cross is that we are not God's biggest disappointment, but rather we are loved by God in spite of our sins and that God longs, longs to restore us and redeem us. So one of the ways that we can experience God's restoring grace is to pray through those times of trouble in our lives. Another way to keep the light on in your life is to get with the people of God. You know, after what Peter did, I would have fully expected to read that Peter was now hanging out at the local tavern, uh, drowning his sorrows and his guilt. Or he, maybe he would be out with his fishing buddies back home, just trying to forget everything and to put it all behind him. But the next time that we read about Peter, we find that he's back with the disciples. He's back with God's people. <laughs> and that's where we need to strive to be as well. Now, let's don't kid ourselves. <laughs> There are some of God's people, or at least some who claim to be God's people, who are critical, they're judgmental, they're condescending toward others, and that's not the kind of people I'm talking about being around. We need to try to avoid being around those kind of people at all costs. But you know of people in your life who are like Jesus. Their arms are open. Their heart is accepting. They're willing to try to help you to get back on your feet through encouragement. And it's those kind of people that we need to seek to allow to minister God's grace to our life. And finally, here's the third thing that I think we can do to experience God restoring grace in our life. And that is to try to keep the fire burning. Keep the fire burning. Now, in this story, I think there are two things that help contribute to the change that Peter experienced in his life. Uh, things that happened in his life between the time of his denial to the time of his uh, dynamic ministry for Christ. Do you know what those two things were? Well, the first thing was that he got serious about loving Jesus. In John chapter 21, we have this beautiful scene of, uh, on the beach where Jesus is having a conversation with Peter. And in this conversation, Jesus reinstates Peter, so to speak, to his position of leadership. And in that conversation, you remember that three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. Now, there was a lot going on in this conversation, but at the heart of it, Jesus was challenging Peter to love him more. 
and to serve him by serving others. Folks, the same is true for us. Listen, the fire of the Christian life is not found in the rituals or the traditions or the songs or even in the sermon or in potluck suppers nor in anything else. Those things may be important, but the fire of the Christian life is always going to be found in our love for Jesus Christ and our willingness to love others. This comes first above everything else. I mean, this is why Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So if you want to experience the restoring grace of God in your life, you have to take a look at your heart. I mean, your heart may be feeling cold and dark, but you can regain that fire burning within your soul by seeking to love God more and to serve and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. I think the second thing that contributed to the change in Peter's life was that he experienced the power of God's Holy Spirit in his life. You know, after the resurrection, you remember how Jesus said to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In other words, a crucial part of the process of restoration for them and for us was an indwelling of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. Because you cannot live the redeemed life by your own power and by your own efforts. It takes the the work of God's Holy Spirit going on in your life to do that. I mean, trying to do it on his own power, that's what got Peter in the mess he was in. But after Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, he became a changed man. He began to walk in the power of God, and God began to do powerful things through him. So if you want the fire burning within your spirit, and you want to be restored by the grace of God, then you have to be open to God's Holy Spirit at work in your life. You have to invite and ask for God's Spirit to come into your life and to fill you with His presence and His power so that you can live the life that God calls you to live. As I said, I, I love this story because it reminds us of the good news that it doesn't matter how far you have fallen or how many times you've fallen in your life, that God's grace can restore you. The guilt, the shame, the sense of failure, all that can be wiped away by the God's mercy. You can live a life of joy, a life of hope, a life of freedom, knowing that you are forgiven. For our God is the God of the forgotten past, but our God is also the God of the brand new day. Not just another miserable day where you're reliving the same old uh, defeats, the same old failures in life, but a brand new day, a day of victory, a day of restoration, a day of power, a new beginning. So you may be tempted to give up on yourself, but don't give up on God. Keep the door open to God's grace because he longs to restore you. Keep the light on by spending time in God's Word and, and through prayer and by spending time with God's people. Keep the fire burning in your life by returning to your first love, asking Him to give you a heart of love for Him and a love for others. And seek to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Pray that God's Spirit comes in your life, enabling you to walk every day in His power. As it was with Peter, you too, can experience new life through the restoring grace of God. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for the story of Peter, for we realize that it's our story too. For like Peter, we have failed to be the people you created us to be. We too have fallen short of your glory and our sin is ever before us. But we turn to you giving thanks and trusting in your restoring grace. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to make the depth of your love and your grace known to us. May we receive that grace today and may we live in the assurance of it. Help us to love you more. Help us to serve others in your name. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may live every day in your grace. As we pray in the name of Jesus, Amen. All right, well, let us uh, close.
close our worship service together today singing the song, Who You Say I Am.